Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar from Learn the Birds. Uh, good to see a whole bunch of you getting in at the last minute. Um, yes, thank you for joining us. Just a little bit of background before we start. Learn the Birds was started by my good friend Derek Keats and myself. I think Derek uh, strong armed me into starting to do this. And what we've tried to do is to create a platform for birding information, birding education, uh, all things to do with birding and ornithology to be made available on a platform to the wider community, both uh, locally in Southern Africa and internationally. And we've already had a really interesting lineup of speakers from all over the world, and we, we've got more, to, more to, to offer, which Derek will mention, I think, at the end of his talk. So tonight, um, um, uh, Dr. Derek Keats is giving us a, a talk on the evolutionary biology of birds. And um, just by way of introduction, uh, Derek is a, a, has been a biology professor for over 20 years. Um, he was deputy vice chancellor of Wits University, a marine biologist who discovered several species of uh, new to science, not birds. He's published widely and he's always been uh, passionate about bringing science and nature to lay people and communicating uh, this in a user-friendly way. And currently, uh, Derek hails from Canada originally, but he's lived in Southern Africa for a long time now. And he loves bird photography. And of course, uh, evolution is one of his, his key interests. Um, so he's gonna share with us tonight his insights and understanding of the role of evolution in birds and also the role of birds in our understanding of evolution. If I can just say from my side, uh, if you bird, I think particularly the desert regions of Southern Africa, which I love so much, and you see all the shapes of the bills of the different locks and how they're adapted to the specific uh, foraging uh, strategies and environments, then you know, understanding of evolution makes so much more sense. And I think gives you so much of a clearer understanding of what's going on around you. So uh, having said that, I'd like to hand over to Derek. Thanks, Derek. And I'm sure this is going to be an excellent webinar. Uh, sorry, just uh, before, before handing over to Derek, um, just, just to mention that we are recording the webinar. Um, if people could keep themselves on mute at all times, and if you want to ask questions, please pose them in the chat room. You'll see the chat button at the bottom of the uh, chat button at the bottom of your Zoom. Just pose your questions to everyone and we'll take them at the end of Derek's presentation. So over to Derek. Yeah, and uh, uh, thanks Etienne very much. Um, I think also we're a relatively small uh, group of people. We're less than 20, so we can probably just allow people to open the mics and ask the questions themselves at the end as well if they prefer that. Otherwise, uh, the chat is a good place. Uh, and I must apologize for my not having my learned the birds background tonight. I just realized it now when I started up, but uh, that's how it is. Uh, Multi-purpose uh, use of this computer. So I'm just going to start my, uh, my uh, presentation here. Just bear with me for a second. Uh, thank you. And here we go. Um, so I can't see the chat or anything now. So if there's any anything that goes wrong or any anything I, that I need to be interrupted for, Etienne, just shout uh, because I won't be able to see any other uh, method because I've got the presentation running across both yes, screens. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that, Derek. No problem. Okay, cool. So um, I, I got the idea of doing something on basic evolutionary biology for birders after. Uh, being out in, you know, and, and going to twitches or meeting other birders in bird hides and places like that, and realizing that uh, the level of knowledge of evolutionary biology among the birding community was not what I would expect it to be, given that, you know, birds are biological organisms and you can't really understand them unless you understand something of their biology. Um, so, uh, as Etienne said, uh, who am I? I was a professor of uh, marine, specializing in marine biology for roughly 20 years. I spent quite a bit of time 
uh, working in the oceans all around the world. Uh, been very lucky in that regard. And, but I, let, I got involved in university management and I spent 10 years there in the university senior management. And then I got involved in technology startups and I've been for the last nine years involved in technology startups. Uh, hence me bringing my uh, technology knowledge together with uh, my interest in birding to uh, work with Etienne to start Learn the Birds. So I've kind of come back to my biology roots after 19 years of, uh, of absence. And when I was doing biology, I was interested in systematics and, uh, and phylogeny. That means the evolutionary history of uh, organisms and of course, ecology. And most of my research was in these areas. And uh, I'm trying now to bring some of my knowledge and understanding of these areas to birds and birding, but I need to make it very clear that I'm not an ornithologist and I've never scientifically studied bird evolution um, but I've taught about it in first year biology classes and I'm trying to bring some of these ideas um, to the birding community. So last weekend, uh, I went off to uh, Lichalamitsi in uh, Limpopo province. Uh, the primary reason was to go and uh, spend some time with Narina Trogans, probably the best place to actually spend time watching uh, Trogans because they, they just in the forest there and you, you just go can you can watch them especially this time of the year when uh, they're uh, starting the breeding season and they're starting the males are starting calling um, they're a lot easier to find than they are at other times of the year but I started thinking you know the Narina trogon is uh, Apoloderma narina it belongs to this this one particular genus that's restricted to Africa but you know what is it about trogons that we can say, well, they belong to this family uh, called the uh, Trogonidae, And there are 46 species in seven genera in the world today. Um, but the fossil record of trogons dates back to 49 million years. That is a long time. That is a very, very long time. If you think about some of our smaller birds have probably only been around, their families have probably only been around for uh, between five and 10 million years. So 49 million years is a very long time. Uh, the Neotropic says 24 species, uh, the Neotropics being uh, uh, basically Latin America um, has uh, 24 species covering four genera. Uh, we have three in Africa, all, all as I said, belonging to Apoloderma. And, and there's also obviously um, some species in Asia as well. Um, but, uh, you know, more than there is in Africa, not as many as in the, neo in the neotropics. So how does this pattern come about? If you're, if you're a birder and you actually want to understand the Narina trogon, uh, rather than, other than just going looking at it because it's uh, such a pretty bird, um, you know, if you're going to understand this bird, if you're going to understand the species, if you're going to understand its relationship to other species around the world, you have to understand something about evolution and evolutionary biology. So, you know, how do you understand birds if you don't understand evolution? And I, I guess the short answer is you don't uh, because, you know, evolution is such a fun, evo, evo, the evolutionary history of the group birds is such a fundamental thing to birds and understanding how different birds came to be the way they are, evolution is fundamental to that. So if you, if you want to go beyond just the basics of, you know, seeing a bird, watching a male chasing a female or, or uh, you know, uh, the, the kinds of things that we, you know, we all, all love doing, you have to delve into some, some evolutionary biology. So what is evolutionary biology to start with? Uh, it's basically the area of biology that studies the processes of evolution, you know, natural selection, sexual selection, common descent, speciation, um, and all of those things that have produced the diversity of life that we have on earth and how within some of, of the groups of organisms, uh, different characteristics have come, come to be. So, you know, it, it deals with how does evolution happen? You know, that's, that might be one of the questions. Uh, it deals, what is the ancestor of a particular group of organisms? And of course it depends on how far back you go. 
uh, we, we share about 60% of our genes with bananas. So clearly we have a common ancestor with bananas at some point, but um, maybe that's uh, going back a bit far. Um, and then, you know, what characteristics contribute to this concept of fitness, which I will talk about uh, during the, the presentation. And then how do species form? So those are, are just some of the kinds of questions that, that live within the realm of evolutionary biology. Um, and it's a very busy and active science these days. So I'm gonna just, I'm, I'm gonna just scratch the surface. I'm gonna just hopefully whet your appetite to, to want to learn more. Uh, so I've got some topics that I'm going to cover, some of them in more detail than others. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of birds in the discovery of natural selection and evolution by natural selection, as Etienne said. Sorry, a mosquito just landed on my cheek. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk about sexual selection, which is Darwin's other theory, and, and the role of birds in its discovery as well. And then we're going to talk about sexual selection by mate choice uh, being one of the core controversies of evolutionary biology. And it will take us back a little bit to the days of Charles Darwin and, and uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. And then we're going to talk about what are species and are they even real? I mean, do species actually exist? We all think we know what species are, but actually, are they real? Do they exist? And then how, if they do exist, how do they form? Uh, and then we're going to look at the awful immensity, immensity and shortness of time. You will see what uh, that means when I come to that section of the talk. We're going to talk a little bit about evolutionary trees from DNA and how we recognize modern bird species, but I'm not going to go into any detail there. So you'll have one slide with one uh, diagram on it that hopefully will give you a sense of how this works. And then we're going to talk about whence cometh our birds, which is a really interesting question. Probably the probably one of the single biggest questions in evolutionary biology in the last uh, 50 to 60 years. And then we're going to look at convergent evolution and the challenges that it creates. And then we're just going to uh, briefly talk about how evolution is still happening. And hopefully that's enough to whet your appetite. So we're going to start off uh, looking at the role of birds in the discovery of uh, natural selection. So uh, way back in 1859, Charles Darwin wrote his first uh, book uh, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And the origin of species, this is the concept that we call speciation today. Um, and uh, Darwin uh, didn't, is not the person who discovered evolution. He is the person who discovered evolution by natural selection. This is often a common mistake that you know we long before darwin we knew about evolution we just didn't know how it happened darwin and alfred russell wallace uh, in their seminal paper be that came out before this book um, were the first to understand uh, uh, exactly how evolution works by means of natural selection so the story begins in the galapagos islands which uh, um, I think this is Bartolome uh, here, or uh, we, I can't remember the name of this island. Anyway, I, I was privileged to go to Galapagos a few years ago, so I've had a chance to see. Um, it is, uh, uh, it's about between 906 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. It's a province of Ecuador, uh, and it is probably, as a naturalist, as a biologist, the single most important place in the world to visit. Uh, I was there because I was studying calcareous algae at the time. Um, I wasn't really into birds, but you can't really avoid the birds in Galapagos because they're everywhere. Uh, you know, species like the blue-footed booby, um, the frigate birds, and of course the uh, amazing Galapagos penguin, which is a little bit like our, our African penguin. Uh, maybe it's a slightly smaller, I can't remember now. Uh, but they were, every time we went diving, they were all around us, flying around underwater. It's uh, quite amazing. So the Galapagos is a series of islands. Uh, some of them are very large and they're quite high because they're volcanic islands. And some of them are quite small, uh, steep with very little vegetation. Uh, and some of them, and, and there's also differences in rainfall between the different islands. 
um, as a consequence of the of the differences in altitude. Uh, the, you know, some of the islands are big enough to have rivers. Uh, there's a lot of different habitats. And, uh, and so there are opportunities there for, for birds uh, to take advantage of those different habitats. Um, and, and the story, the famous story is of course, the, the one of Darwin's finches. And this is as close as I ever got to a Darwin's finch. This is a medium ground finch. And I had just come back from diving and, and we were walking up the, up the beach carrying our diving gear and I had an underwater camera with me and I walked up really close to this bird and I took a picture of it with an underwater camera with 35 millimeter lens. So this is the only Galapagos finch that I have a picture of. So uh, the Galapagos finches, Darwin spent quite a bit of time studying them both when he was there and the, 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 the dead specimens that he brought back with him that were collected uh, while he was there, um, you know, in those days, uh, people went out and collected birds. They shot them with, uh, with a shotgun, in other words, um, to to bring them back. Um, now we miss net them and study them and let them go again, but that's how they did it in those days. And uh, Darwin spent quite a bit of time after he got back studying these uh, these finches, and he drew the conclusion that the islands were populated by a single common ancestor that arrived from the mainland. And because of all the different habitats and, uh, and all of the, um, the different food types that the birds could eat and the absence of competition from other species, um, those birds diversified and evolved into, into different species that some of which were, uh, which became uh, insectivores, some of which uh, ate uh, buds, some of which ate flower, which uh, fed primarily on flowers uh, and some which uh, fit, you know, fed primarily on the ground, picking up seeds that, uh, that were windblown and so on. And you know, the, the, um, the, the tremendous diversity happened in the Galapagos over a few million years um, by the initial colonization from the mainland. And we now have DNA evidence to support this. Um, all of the, the, the birds uh, show a um, common ancestral relationship with uh, birds on the South American mainland. And we now know that these are tanagers, uh, not uh, true finches. Um, and uh, although there are lots of birds that are placed in tanagers that are in fact uh, being found now to be true finches, the Galapagos finches are tanagers. Um, so what, are we, what is this? What's happening here? This is, uh, is known as adaptive radiation. It's a process. Uh, by which organisms diversify rapidly from uh, an ancestr ancestral species into a, a, a multitude of forms. So it can happen uh, when, you know, new resources become available. Uh, you know, maybe a new plant has, uh, or a plant, uh, you know, a plant has developed uh, some new uh, kind of seeds and is evolving into a different species with a different kind of seeds from what the Old, old ones, all the birds, uh, other birds fed on, the, sorry, the birds previously fed on. Uh, and so new features arise in order to take advantage of those new available resources. Uh, another is if new challenges arise. So maybe the climate changes, um, maybe there's a, a new uh, immigrant species that arrives in an area and there's more competition. Um, so, you know, any kind of new challenge can also lead to this. And then new niches are available. So this is really what, what happened with the, with the Galapagos finches. Um, the, the ancestral bird of the, arrived in, in the Galapagos, found that there were all these niches that uh, were unoccupied. There was no other birds uh, at the time uh, feeding in the same way or living in the same way or nesting in the same way. Uh, so these niches were available for colonization and the birds evolved rapidly to take advantage of these different niches. Uh, now, just to, uh, you know, we often think that these kinds of evolutionary changes happen over very, very long times. Uh, Rosemary and, and Peter Grant, um, I think they're at, uh, oh, I can't remember what university they're at, but they're at one of the big and uh, famous universities in the US. Um, they spent 40 years in the Galapagos studying these finch, finches and, you know, they go for uh, six months or so and live on an island and study the finches and they've written some marvelous 
uh, works of science uh, as, as a result. But I'm going to try and summarize their, their life's work in, in one sentence. Um, but what they found is that the beak size uh, of, of, the, of the finches is able to change measurably in response to selection pressures. That's uh, um, you know, something that causes uh, the birds to be stressed in some way or that uh, provides differential, um, uh, differential survival and reproduction of certain birds with certain characteristics. And they discovered that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the difference between drought and rainfall years can lead to uh, changes in the big, big size of birds over one or two generations. In other words, over, uh, you know, just a couple of years. And this is quite astonishing. And it, show, it goes to show uh, how strong selective pressure can lead to evolution and is a, is a major uh, explanation for how um, the, the, the uh, diversification, the adaptive radiation of finches could happen actually quite quickly when the ancestor, when the common ancestor arrived in uh, Galapagos. So coming back to Darwin, um, you know, the Galapagos finches uh, uh, were one of the uh, key pieces of, of information that uh, Darwin collected when he was going around on the Beagle and and that, uh, you know, that subsequently did to him to understand how natural selection can work. So birds played a major role in our understanding of evolution by natural selection. So let's look at what is natural selection anyway. So uh, <clears throat> natural selection is basically nothing more than differential survival and or reproduction of individuals because of differences in the features that they have. Uh, in other words, the phenotype. So the phenotype is how an organism is, ex how an organism's genes are expressed. So my phenotype is my body and uh, and all of its characteristics and um, uh, you know the, you know the things that uh, that are good and bad about about how my genes are expressed. And some of those in natural uh, circumstances might limit my ability to survive or reproduce. So in, um, you know, in a natural environment, for example, if I had uh, early onset diabetes, I probably wouldn't have survived to reproduce. So the characteristics um, are thus eliminated from the population in favor of other characteristics. And that's basically what natural selection is. Um, and it's premised on, on the fact in to use modern terminology uh, that uh, that genetically determined variation exists in populations. Um, uh, Darwin would have just said variation exists in populations, but we now know that this that the 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 variation has to be genetically determined. And some variations serve better for survival and and or reproduction. So you know if you have a gene for uh, a longer bill in a place where a longer bill gets you more food, you're going to have a better chance of surviving and you're going to leave more offspring. And so the gene for having a longer bill is going to increase in frequency in the population over, uh, over time. And, and, and uh, so that is basically what, um, what happens. The genes that cause these variations increase in the population over time. And so those characteristics that are controlled by the genes increase in the population over time. And it doesn't need to take a long time. So some, uh, sometimes, you know, if, uh, 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 evolving an entirely new thing is something that takes long. But once that thing has evolved, um, changes in it, uh, are, are, are much, can happen much faster. So it may have taken a long time for, for the ancestors of birds to evolve the bill. But once the birds had a bill or a beak, um, changes in the, in the beak can happen quite quickly. And those changes are the basis of evolution by natural selection. And that's basically uh, a story that, um, you know, that we um, got by studying birds.
So I talked about fitness. I mentioned fitness. I probably should say what fitness is. And this is what we typically think about when we think about fitness. And we often hear the term survival of the fittest. And it kind of is linked in people's minds to this kind of view of fitness. But a small scrawny human might be fitter than these two. So from an evolutionary perspective, depending on the habitat, so this is not the kind of uh, fitness that we talking about when we're talking about evolutionary fitness or biological fitness. The term was actually uh, coined by Herbert Spencer and published in his book, uh, Principles of Biology in 1864. And basically it, me it just means better suited for a particular environment. So if you are a human and you are small and scrawny, uh, you, you know, there may be uh, environments in which being small and scrawny makes you more fit for the environment than being uh, muscular and larger in size. So it has nothing to do with that view of fitness. We often also think about fitness, uh, you know, from the point of view of predators and the predator. I've, I've heard people say that, you know, um, a lion uh, eats an impala or oh, that's survival of the fittest. No, it's not. It has nothing to do with evolutionary fitness. That's just a predator taking down a prey. And the two have, uh, you know, this is not what uh, survival of the fittest means. It's not what biological fitness means. It means simply the survival of the phenotype that will leave the most copies of itself in successive generations. Uh, and that actually means that if the phenotype is controlled by genes, it means the survival of the genotype that's going to leave the most copy of, copies of itself uh, in successive generations. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, coined the term the selfish gene uh, because essentially organisms are what they are because their genes um, are more, the genes that are within them are more successful at leaving more copies of themselves. So that's basically what survival of the fittest means. It has nothing to do with fitness and it has nothing to do with fighting or, or, or any of those macho things. It's about being uh, fit to leave more offspring or more copies of your genes. So um, that's natural selection and the role that birds played in natural selection and what natural selection means. Uh, let's look at another uh, uh, theory that Darwin came up with, which is uh, sele sexual selection. And birds also played a significant role in Darwin's development of the theory of selec sexual selection and his understanding of um, the, the, the alternative ways in which selection pressure can be placed upon organisms. Uh, you know, this was uh, published in, in his book uh, in 1871 called The Descent of Man and Section in, and Selection in Relation to Sex. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, those two things are related, uh, but we're going to focus on the role of birds in Darwin's uh, elucidation of, of the theory of sexual selection. And one bird that features very strongly in this book and in Darwin's understanding of sexual selection is known as the great Argus pheasant, which occurs in, uh, I think it's the island of Borneo in Indonesia. Anyway, it's one of the islands in Indonesia. And the males are ridiculous. I mean, they have these massive uh, uh, displays that they put on, they have huge feathers, they have intricate or ornate uh, decorations. And the female, um, at the top there, I think is, you know, it's a bit more drab, doesn't have these ornate decorations. Um, and there's, you know, this is an example of extreme sexu sexual dimorphism. The, the, the two sexes are radically different. Um, and uh, the males obtain characters as a result, or Darwin's view at the time was that the males obtain characters as a result of the females choosing males that uh, that have the precursors to those characters. So over generations, over generations. So let's look at the, uh, the dots on the wing, on the wings of uh, the, the Argus pheasant. 
So maybe at some point there were males that had uh, a few dots on their wings and the females liked those. So they uh, mated more often with those males and they left more offspring. So the genes for those dots increased in the population. The next generation, there were a few males that had a few more dots and the females liked those dots more. And so over many, many generations, these dots uh, came to uh, uh, be a prominent feature of the wings of the of the Argus pheasant and the same for other characteristics and it's not just how the bird looks it's how it sings it's how it uh, it's how it behaves it's mating dances I'm sure you've all seen uh, the bird of paradise with their uh, amazingly exquisite uh, displays that happen during a, a, a mating um, uh, about so Darwin's view was that uh, these characters are selected over generations due to the females making choices. Uh, and he called this uh, se sexual selection by uh, mate choice, or in this case, uh, sexual selection by female choice. Uh, Darwin actually identified two types of sexual selection, uh, male contests. And sorry for the slide being a bit bland. I just put it in at the last minute. Um, he identified two types of sexual selection, male contests, so combat and displays, um, where the males chase other males away or they fight other males. Uh, you know, this, this commonly happens. You, you often see doves, for example, outside your window and the, you know, one male dove will chase another male dove away. Um, uh, you know, birds often also um, mate in leks, uh, which is areas where the males come together to compete for females and they will often chase each other away uh, or, or uh, attempt to display uh, in an intimidating way that makes the other male leave. And then the other one is mate choice or female choice, uh, predominantly female choice. So this uh, um, idea of sexual selection by female choice was elucidated by uh, Darwin studying birds. Then um, this has since become a core controversy in evolutionary biology. Uh, D Darwin uh, died a few, quite a few years before Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, Darwin's idea was that the females choose characters purely for aesthetic reasons. They have no other reason for choosing uh, um, those characters. And if you look at the Goldie's Bird of Paradise on the left there, um, you can see that the male has pretty uh, incredible, um, uh, you know, incredibly ornate features. Uh, it's difficult to imagine those features being associated with any kind of fitness other than uh, the fitness to leave more offspring because females like males that have these ornate uh, um, patterns and colors and behaviors. So that was Darwin's view that it is, is purely aesthetic. Wallace said, uh-uh, um, the characters are actually a signal of male fitness. And males that can produce all of these ornate characters um, are likely to be better fit, have a better, stronger immune system and so on. And so be better able to support young if, uh, if, if the males do in fact care for the young. Um, and, uh, and so this became a central controversy in biology. Now, the interesting thing about um, these ornate displays is they almost entirely restricted to birds that are polygynous. In other words, the males mate with multiple females. And, uh, and, the, and the consequence of that is that the, the uh, more the more uh, different females that, the, that a male will mate with, the more likely the female is to be what to us appears to be drab in color. Um, this uh, controversy continues today. It's still not uh, resolved, but there is plenty of evidence that females do have, aesthetic, um, uh, have an aesthetic basis for their choice. That is not to say that, that there may not be some uh, adaptive signaling in, the, in there as well, but these are two different theories to explain why 
uh, uh, females choose uh, males with these particular characteristics. Um, and if you, um, if you think about it, um, this, these theories uh, arose during Victorian times when people were very conservative. Uh, uh, it was a very patriarchal society. Um, you know, males were dominated in, dominating in the, in the human world and it was almost impossible for them to imagine that a female choosing a mate could cause um, the, uh, uh, the, this kind of evolution. Uh, but we've seen it time and again that the female choice leads to these runaway um, patterns of the development of ornate features. So certainly uh, the aesthetic uh, uh, approach or the aesthetic theory um, is at least correct in some cases. Um, there may also be cases where female choice is, uh, is determined by the actual um, adaptive fitness of, of the males as well, they're not mutually exclusive. And sometimes they may overlap. And there's one theory that says that uh, initially the, the choice was made because of the actual real fitness of the male, um, but then it, it, it started to run away as the females decided, uh, uh, you know, I like the males with the longer red, uh, um, uh, you know, fuzzy wings, because, um, just it appeals to me. And they just selected males with longer and longer wings. So there's an interesting study that has been done with our long-tailed widow bird. And uh, you may know about this, um, but it was done. Uh, so yeah, so the, the, the long-tailed widow, widow bird's mostly pretty drab uh, in the winter, but uh, at this time of the year now, they're starting to get their summer colors uh, grow their long tails, uh, get the, 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 the red pattern on their wings, uh, red and yellow pattern on their wings, and start to look like this. So one of the, uh, so, so this research was done by Malta Anderson. Uh, it was published in Nature uh, back in 1982. So it's, it's, it's quite uh, uh, dated research now. So as you would expect, the, the males are polygynous. They mate with multiple females. Um, the, this long-tailed widow bird is, has the most extreme or, ornamentation in the Suplectes genus. And so what um, uh, Malta Anderson did was uh, a very clever, clever trick. He took, uh, caught some widow birds in a mist net and uh, removed part of the tail or some of the tail feathers and glued those tail feathers onto other males. And <clears throat> what he found was that the males with the longest tails, artificially longest tails, um, had an average uh, uh, mean number of nests of two. Um, the, uh, um, the, male, the normal males uh, had an average mean number of uh, success you know, um, um, with an average mean number of nests of one, and the ones with the shortened tails only had half a, uh, an average of half a nest. In other words, some of the males didn't get to mate at all. Now, this is really interesting because it shows that the females are choosing not on the basis of any kind of uh, indication of fitness, but simply because they prefer uh, longer tails. Now you could say, well, maybe the, the males with the longer tails are, are, are better able to defend their territory, but they measured this and there was no impact of the tail length on, um, on the ability of males to, uh, to defend their territory. So clearly there's a strong role of female choice in the evolution of long tails of these birds. And the females chose males with tails so long that the, bird, the males couldn't fly. I could just pop up off the ground and fall back down again because their tails were so long. And the uh, females chose those males with long tails, the longest tails. So now if you look at the genus Euplectes in, uh, in South Africa, we have a, a number of species. And some of them are bishop birds and some of them are widow birds with longer tails. Um, some interesting work was done with bishop birds by Sarah Prake and uh, Stefan Anderson and published in the journal Behavioral Ecology back in 2008. And they 
showed that there was some female preference for longer tails, even in the bishop birds. So, but the extreme, uh, but the but the you know the bishop bird birds don't evolve long tails. How come? So uh, they discovered that once you start adding a little bit of length to the tail, uh, the females will choose those birds. But once you make it more than a few centimeters, couple of centimeters long, the females don't recognize them as the same species anymore. So they just ignore them completely. So female preference for long tails is actually constrained by the ability of the females to recognize their own uh, males, which is an interesting uh, aspect, just to give you a sense of the kind, some of the kinds of work that gets done in this field of evolutionary biology. Okay, so let's move on from that and let's talk about what are species, because this is something that even, even if you're not interested in evolutionary biology, should be of interest to birders. So I think the important thing to remember is that the idea of a species is a human construct. Yeah, it's like money, countries, those kinds of things. We made it up, it doesn't exist in nature, it's not real. It's just an idea that we've imposed on nature as opposed to something which is um, you know, fundamentally a part of, of nature in an objective way, which doesn't mean that it's not useful. Money is useful. The concept of species is useful, but we need to understand that, uh, you know, it is a human construct. Uh, Darwin knew this. So his view was that a species is a term arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other. Um, and that's mm, pretty much how we use the term in a lot of cases today. Uh, then Ernest Mayer came along in the 1940s and he said, about, there's a thing called the biological species, which means that it's individuals that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Uh, you know, except in a, in a few species, this is difficult to show. So it's not very practical to determine whether uh, species can interbreed because if they live in different parts of the world or uh, you know, the, the, you know, for some species, not birds, but for other, other species, plants and um, um, microorganisms, they may not even um, reproduce sexually anyway. So this is not a very useful definition. And in fact, it, we know it doesn't really work very well, uh, even where you can actually test it. Uh, so a lot of people use the idea of a morphological species, which is basically the same as as Darwin's view, except it's got some um, objective criteria attached to it. Um, it. You know, so a morphological species is, is individuals that appear identical or close to it by morphological criteria. Now, when I was doing most, when I was doing my taxonomy of uh, marine uh, algae uh, and describing uh, new species, I guess I was pretty much using the morphological species because I had at the time no other way uh, to, to uh, no other definition of species to, to use. The DNA work was just uh, beginning. And uh, so, you know, we, we used the con concept of morphological species. <clears throat> and now we have the concept of genetic species, which is a group of genetically compatible interbreeding when they breed natural populations that are genetically isolated from other such groups. Um, and, you know, we can tell whether they're genetically isolated by looking at particular genes. Um, we can get uh, ideas of when they may have diverged by looking at the so-called molecular clock. Um, and there are lots of ways where we can use genetics uh, to test our hypotheses with morphological species. And what we're finding now that we're looking at things from a genetic perspective is um, that there are often species that are pretty much identical, but different in their, in their genetics. Then there are also species that are, that are radically different in their appearance, but not distinguishable at the genetic level. So, so this is a whole area that is uh, really still under um, 
under under study. And then basically arising out of the idea of a genetic species is a phylogenetic species, which is, you know, it's it's uh, or how do organisms differ, uh, or how much are they similar in their genetic makeup? So, for example, say a two percent difference for animals might be something that would be considered to be sufficient to warrant calling them different species. But then, you know, we're closer than that to bonobos, so that would make us bonobos, and it would depend on whether Homo sapiens or or Pan, uh, whatever the uh, species of bonobo is, um, was described as to whether our Homo sapiens is our correct species name or not. Clearly, that's a bit silly, but the same uh, thing, the same thing happens in birds. You know, it, the 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 level of uh, this difference that leads to us calling something a different species is highly variable in different groups um, and, uh, and, and that applies even within the birds. So my definition of species is it's whatever biologist working on that particular group considers to be a species. And that is a species for operational purposes and that's all we need. Um, obviously, you know, these, that's not very satisfactory but for the time being, uh, uh, it's, it's, it is what it is, you know. So now, does it really matter when we're looking at these uh, species from, a, from a, when we're looking at these organisms from an evolutionary perspective, does it really matter how a species is defined? So I'm going to tell you a little story that says that it does matter. And this is a well-known story in ornithology, uh, and in evolutionary biology in general, but I think it's it's one um, that is worth thinking about when we're looking at uh, uh, at different species and subspecies of of birds. So <clears throat> um, there is this bird called a dusky seaside sparrow. Uh, it's beautiful, dark, blackish color uh, with a dus with that dusky plumage um, uh, and. Uh, it was first characterized as a species in the late 1800s, 1873. It's restricted to the marshes of Florida's Atlantic coast and was considered to be endangered. Then uh, some biologists came along and, and studied it and they decided that, ah, no, it's, it's not really a species. It's just a subspecies of the seaside sparrow. So this was a hundred years later um, that it was then lumped into the into the seaside sparrow and later on um oh and then you know we know that typically conservation decisions are taken at the species level particularly in organ you know when there's organizations uh, that are responsible for conserving particular groups of organisms they tend to work at the species level they don't tend to look to work at variations and subspecies and all of those things. Um, so what happened is that the conservation assistance for the dusky seaside sparrow wasn't available. And 10 years later, uh, by the early 1980s, the dusky sparrow, the dusky seaside sparrow was extinct. And the reason was that the area where it occurred is also the area of the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, they wanted they did they they flooded the island to to reduce the the mosquito population, and th there were some other things. There was some pollution and so on. But basically, they destroyed the nesting areas of the dusky seaside sparrow. In the process of doing that, um, they wiped it out. Later on, we managed to get uh, you know biologists managed to get some DNA and do the analysis and showed that you know, the, the, the actual uh, dusky seaside sparrow had separated from the, from the seaside sparrow between 250,000 and 500,000 years ago. And that's more than long enough to be considered a separate species. If you think about it, our species, um, you know, is, is, is much less, uh, uh, you know, differentiated from other species of Homo much less, uh, much less long ago than that. So, we basically wiped out a species because we lumped it into uh, uh, into another species, and this is 
you know, this is one of the dangers of lumping and, and uh, you know, we always talk about in, in systematics is lumping and splitting. So you can split a species into two other species on the basis of, you know, they look different or they call, call differently or they have different genetics. Um, uh, but, you know, lumping is very dangerous, especially when one of the forms is, uh, has, uh, has a very low, um, uh, uh, you know, is, isn't, isn't very abundant in the environment. So this is a, an interesting story about our human construct of species and how it can affect the, 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 the genetic diversity of populations and how they're, you know, once we understand their evolution, uh, we can make much more uh, uh, meaningful de de decisions about their conservation. So how species form, I'm just gonna talk about this very, very briefly. Uh, you know, if there's interest, we can come back and do another webinar on this at some point. Um, but, you know, sp speciation, uh, and I've talked about speciation already, but it's basically the evolutionary process by which biological populations evolved from distinct or reproductive, uh, or um, to become, sorry, let me just try this again. <laughs> it's the evolutionary process by which biological populations evolved to become distinct or reproductively isolated as a species. In other words, um, it's how, uh, you know, if we take the dusky seaside sparrow, how did they diverge and why did they diverge and what led to this um, divergence happening? But speciation really is about how, it's about how it happened. And then there are two ways in which speciation can happen. There's allopatric speciation, uh, where they become, where you know, biological populations become geographically isolated from each other um, to the extent that it uh, prevents or interferes with gene flow. Um, and there are lots of ways in which uh, the, the, the populations can become extinct, uh, uh, can become distinct, uh, and become separated. It could be by mountain ranges. It could be by bodies of water, uh, you know, islands uh, with large bodies of, with large, um, uh, oh, you know, over water uh, flyways that the birds would have to travel over in order to get to another island. Um, it can be the, the different mountain ranges. So if you, if you think about the Fainbos vegetation, one of the reasons for the, for the high diversity of species in the Fainbos is because of the, the, the Cape Folded mountain group um, being split up into so many different mountain ranges with space in between them um, and, and so on. So there's lots of ways in which uh, uh, populations can become isolated and then evolve independently. Um, then there's sympatric speciation, which is basically where the species originate in the same uh, geographic variation and uh, in the same geographic region. So, so this could be, um, you know, if you look at the Galapagos, for example, it's a combination of both, and there is a name for that, but I'm not gonna go into those other alternative names right now. But, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the birds um, evolved in the, in the Galapagos, more or less they could fly between the islands if they wanted to. Um, so they are kind of sympatric in one way, but they're allopatric in, a, in, a, in another because once they, it seems like once they got into one island, they kind of stuck, um, stuck to, those, to those islands. Um, another uh, example of sympatric speciation is something that can happen with birds is where birds are sort of slightly isolated into different habitats. And uh, because of uh, female choice of the male's calls, uh, the male's calls evolve independently. So the birds may not look very different, but the, the males may call differently. And this may lead to them becoming separate species. Um, when, they, uh, you know, when they're brought back together again, they can't uh, mate because the females don't recognize the calls of the others. And maybe a good example of that is the, is the Cape White Eye and the Orange River White Eye. You know, they, they, they're very similar. The, the, and they probably uh, were, were sympatric in origin, um, but, they, but they have really different, different calls. So even if they come back together, the, the, they may not be able to uh, mate at the same frequency as they would if with, their own, with, you know, with birds singing the same call. 
I mean, I'm just talking off the top of my head, but that's a, that would be one way in which a sympatric speciation can occur in birds. Um, and then, you know, just, just birds using different areas of the habitat and different habitats within overlapping uh, regions. So, you know, we have a lot of birds in South Africa that, uh, that occur in the same area. I mean, these cisticolas, for example, um, they may use different microhabitats and they may have diverged from a common ancestor some time ago because of their occup occupation of, of different habitats. And if you really want to understand those birds and why aren't, why, why are they so similar, but they're different species, uh, they sing different songs, uh, but they live in the same area, how did they, how did they come to be? So, you know, it's, a, it's, this would be a good example of sympatric speciation. Okay, I'm, uh, I seem to be taking a lot longer to, uh, to speak than I, I, I thought I would. So I'm going to go quickly through this because I really want to do the awful immensity and shortness of time before we shut down. Um, so I've got two concepts here, phylogeny, which is basically the evolutionary history um, um, of relationships among living organisms. So you can see I've drawn a little tree here, which is called the phylogenetic tree, which is basically just a diagram um, that is ex explaining the phylogeny. Uh, and nowadays we can do phylogenetic trees from DNA and, and we can show, you know, the, the, the distance along this axis is how different um, a species is. And we can look at where the, you know, where did the different species uh, div um, uh, diverge from a common ancestor. And normally we would have these shared derived traits, which would be something that everything on, you know, further up would possess. So if we, if we think about, um, I don't know, um, uh, cisticolas as an example, they're all sort of small birds, maybe, uh, uh, you know, drab in color, but maybe they had a, an ancestor that, uh, that was different. So this, this kind of um, uh, shared derived trait would be common in all cisticolas. Um, then you have long cisticolas with long tails and uh, short tails. I'm making this up, by the way. Don't, don't think that this is, is real. Um, but this trait uh, might be shared by all of the um, uh, cisticolas that have it uh, post uh, its evolution. And then they may divide into two different populations, you know, the short-tailed short ones and the long-tailed ones, for example. And that's basically how uh, a phylogenetic tree works. And we can look back and, and look at uh, the history of organisms by looking at their phylogenetic trees. And we can construct phylogenetic trees in different ways. We can use um, morph morphological data, we can use physiological data, we can use genetic data, et cetera, um, to construct these uh, phylogenetic trees. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the awful immensity and shortness of time. Uh, it seems like it seemed like I had an immense amount of time when I started this talk, uh, but it seems like I've gotten to a very short bit of time that's left. So I'm going to try and go quickly. So one of the uh, the things that we need to think about is, as we think about and try to understand birds, is the time frame over which evolution has happened. And uh, you know, we can start with the age of our universe. Um, we can move into the age of our galaxy. Um, we can move into the age of our star system, the solar system. We can move into, we can talk about the origin of life and how long life has been around on Earth. And then we can talk about the origin of birds and we can talk about the origin of humans. And all of these things happen on radically different, and I mean radically different timescales. So if we look at the, at the history of, uh, of, the, of, of the universe, you can see there's, I've got, I've got these little pink blocks here that are, I think they're pink, yeah. Um, that are 1 billion years each. And so we have 13.8 billion years here. Um, we've got, you know, the time at which the, during which the, the, the most uh, supernovae created the heavy elements that make life possible. Uh, then we have the origin of the solar system, you know, one, two, three, four, uh, and a bit, uh, five and a bit um, billion years ago. And the origin of the earth, uh, which is, what is it, 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, the form of, you know, when water became available, then life became available, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have a place that I love to go birding, which is the Fort Dome, the asteroid that hit the Earth uh, 
was uh, roughly two point something uh, billion years ago. So life was around, but not very sophisticated life. Um, then if we draw a line here in this last uh, one billion years and split it up, split this, uh, so this gray area shows this last one billion years being uh, split up. Uh, then we have 100 million, 100 million years in these, each of these green blocks. Uh, so we have life on land evolving, we have sharks evolving, we have amphibians. And then this is where it gets critical. Uh, you know, just um, um, uh, 200 and roughly 220 million years ago, not that long ago on the scale of the universe um, and not that long ago on the scale of, of the history of the earth, uh, dinosaurs came into being. Um, and then we can take this last um, um, 100, 100 million years here and divide it up into 10 million year blocks. And you can see that birds originated um, uh, roughly around 140 something million years ago. So again, not that long ago. Um, and, and, you know, there was bird evolution happening over this, uh, um, you know, roughly, uh, um, you know, nearly 100 million years uh, here, or just over 100 million years ago. And then uh, the Chicxulub asteroid came streaming, screaming into the atmosphere and it hit the earth in the Gulf of Mexico. And it basically wiped out uh, a lot of the life on earth, including the larger uh, of the uh, dinosaurs, uh, leaving only the small ones behind. And after the Chicxulub asteroid hit is when we had this massive uh, adaptive radiation of birds. So we've covered adaptive radiation already. So you know, a lot of niches were left vacant because the, the organisms that had been in those niches previously were wiped out uh, in the aftermath of the asteroid. And then if we look at ourselves, you know, we, we only come in down here in the last couple, you know, 150,000 or so years. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, our time on the planet has is, is been very short and you know, we don't even fit into one pixel uh, here if you want to think about recorded history. So there's a lot of history of the earth and the evolution of birds that goes back a long time before we uh, ever knew anything about it. So where did our birds come from? Um, if, <clears throat> if you look at this map, uh, it shows uh, Laoning in, in China. Uh, which is up near North Korea and in the in the at the at the northern head of the Yellow Sea, um, and in uh, Liaoning, there's been many many fossils of uh, birds and and other small dinosaurs uh, that have been discovered since the 1990s, and these uh, fossils are remarkably well preserved. They're extremely well preserved. And you know, over you know, every year there's uh, you know, thirty or forty papers, maybe more, that are published about the the uh, these fossils. And we're learning more and more every day, and we still have quite a lot to learn. And until the Liaoning fossils were found, we actually didn't know much about you know uh, bird evolution and where birds came from. And you know, we we had lots of ideas, but it was very difficult to find evidence to support those ideas. So we know that uh, many fossils that were found in the, in the Liaoning foundation, uh, in the formations, um, had, were organisms with fossils, but they weren't birds. So they had feathers, um, but they, they were not birds. And they didn't have wings or any of the other modern bird features. Um, there, there have been many intermediate fossils found since then showing uh, the path of bird evolution. And we know that now that feathers evolved in dinosaurs long before birds developed. And certainly well before feathered flight developed. And feathers probably had a single origin. Uh, and fossils from uh, Myanmar and, and Japan also show the same, uh, show the same patterns. So feathers contrary to popular belief, are not a unique characteristic of birds. They are a unique 
characteristic of one lineage, lineage of dinosaurs. And feathers were probably co-opted for flight long after they evolved. They probably originally uh, were used for insulation and, and possibly uh, communication. You know, there probably were dinosaurs that used their feathers just like birds do today um, to show off to females and, and uh, you, you know, give warning signals and things like that. So bird evolution over this, uh, over this um, uh, 100, 140 or so million years was a lot more uh, complex process than we tend to think, than historically we, we, we tended to think. Uh, and it happened over very long stretches of time. So, you know, the dinos this group of dinosaurs, and I'm deliberately not saying the name, this uh, group of dinosaurs um, developed bipedal locomotion, they developed feathers, as flight evolved, they, uh, uh, the collarbones, the clavicles got fused um, into the furcula that is, uh, uh, you know, common to all birds today, the wishbone. Uh, first, they, there were simple feathers that were similar to hair, and then there were quill pen feathers, the feathers that, uh, that are typical of birds today. And then the, the, the ancestral birds evolved wings. And at some point, uh, birds started to sing and they got the shrinks, which is the, um, you know, the, the, the organ that uh, birds use to sing. So whence cometh our birds? Well, birds are theropod dinosaurs. That's what they are. Um, you know, the, the same group of dinosaurs that included Tyrannosaurus rex is what birds are. Um, in <clears throat> a long time ago, this uh, group called the Coelosaurs uh, basically uh, evolved feathers and they were the first group of uh, feathered uh, theropods and there were different groups. I'm, I'm only showing the lineage leading up to birds here. There are other groups and other lineages within the theropods as well. Um, and then um, uh, the uh, feathers continued developing, um, the, 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 the arms continued to get these long slender um, uh, formations, but they weren't used yet for flight in the early uh, many raptors. Um, and then uh, later on, there evolved within the many raptors a group called the uh, Aviali, which is basically birds and their extinct uh, relatives. Sorry, there's mosquitoes in my room here. Um, and uh, then came the Yornithes, which basically are the most recent ancestral group that includes modern birds. And the group Avis, which is basically the modern beak birds and their extinct relatives. And um, all of these aren't, are, are, are considered clades. They don't really use terms like families and classes because if we start applying those terminologies, uh, then birds become paraphyletic. That means they don't include um, their most recent common ancestor with other non-birds and uh, so they, they, you know, the, 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 the terms just don't make sense. But birds are theropods. So when you look outside your window and you see the, pi the pigeon here, think this is in the same group of dinosaurs as Tyrannosaurus rex. So, well, and when did birds get their song? So the oldest fossil of an avian shrinx was discovered um, in uh, Antarctica. Uh, and this bird, uh, similar to a modern duck, lived in the Antarctic uh, Peninsula between 66 and 69 million years ago. So around about the time of the Jigsalab asteroid, um, <clears throat> it may have survived the asteroid or it may have just skirted the edge of, of, of survival, but it's the earliest uh, shrinks that we know. And so this was presumably a singing bird, or at least it had a voice similar to what modern birds have. Um, and, uh, you know, the trouble with the shrinks is it's very delicate and it doesn't fossilize very easily. So it could be that uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, you know, had a chirping call. No, I'm kidding. Um, but it, it could be that many earlier dinosaurs had shrinkses as well and had these uh, kind of uh, bird-like bird calls, but we don't know. But this is the earliest uh, that it was found. So it seems like uh, the shrinks may have evolved in 
uh, in the early modern birds. Okay, so then we've got uh, one more concept, which is convergent evolution. Uh, this is the process whereby organisms that are not closely related evolve independently because uh, uh, similar traits independently uh, because they're adapting to similar environments or exploiting similar ecological niches. Oops, sorry. Um, so swallows and swifts, for example. So what is this? What is a niche? A niche is basically the total way of life of a species, um, you know, the, or the match of a species to specific environmental conditions. So that it could include food and feeding. It could include behaviors. It could include reproduction. It could include things like predators and avoiding predation. It could in, in, include uh, competitors and competition. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, but it, the, the most common thing that is included in the niche would be the feeding and the habitat that the bird occupies. So the higher the overlap of, of, of uh, between two species, the more intense they compete. If their niche overlaps a lot, they will compete intensely. And this may lead to selective pressure for differentiation. So one of the species or <clears throat> potentially both may change over time because of this uh, competition. And that's another way in which uh, speciation can happen. And it's one of the mechanisms for, speci for allopatric speciation. Sorry, for sympatric speciation, where uh, speciation happens in the same area. OK, so swallows and swifts, um, you know, they belong to completely different groups. Uh, one is a, passer uh, a passeriform, and the other is a potiform. Um, and you know, they show convergent evolution because they're adapting uh, they, they have a, adaptations to hunting insects on the wing. And <clears throat> a convergence in evolution complicates our understanding of birds' uh, systematics because the same trait arises multiple times. So in the swallow <clears throat> and the swift here, you can see that they have very similar wings. And this trait arose in two different lineages. So this complicates things because, you know, with swallows and swifts, it's obvious for other reasons that they're different, but it's not always obvious. And, and so this is why we get things like lumping and splitting at higher taxonomic levels than species. So we know, for example, that um, uh, uh, the tanagers, uh, the, you know, there's uh, tanagers currently make up, what is it, 4% 4 4 of all the birds in the world. Um, they're incredibly diverse. Uh, but many of the birds that are placed into tanagers uh, are actually ones that are actually, um, uh, you know, they're actual true finches that have evolved characters that make them look like uh, tanagers because of a convergent evolution. And this makes taxon taxonomy very difficult when, you know, we don't have a lot of characters to go on. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish up with this one. Evolution is still going on. Um, we can look at our white eyes, uh, the Zosteropathy. There's 100 species worldwide in this family. Um, our own white eyes were studied by Graham Oatley in, in, for his PhD in 2011. And he showed a relationship, something like this, where you know the Orange River white eye is basal to the African yellow white eye group and, uh, and to the Cape white eye. And the Cape white eye has two forms, the gray-bellied uh, form capensis and the yellow greenish uh, bellied form uh, virens and using the DNA he was able to show that they're not very different they're not so recently diverged that we can consider them separate species but this could be a situation similar to the um, to the uh, dusky um, uh, swallow that we talked uh, sorry the dus dusky sparrow that we talked about you know where the uh, the evolution is fairly recent but they are in fact undergoing speciation. Um, the, uh, um, and this divergence actually occurred quite recently during the mid Pleistocene, only 120, uh, one, only 1.2 point. Oh, I'm speaking like Donald Trump now. Only 1.25 million years ago. Um, now there's, a, there's another PhD thesis done by Siobhan Cox um, and on, on uh, a much larger range of uh, white eye species. And the African yellow white eye is a lot more complicated than is indicated here. I haven't finished reading this thesis yet. I, I, I intend to though. Um, 
and but some of the work, some of her work has come out in the latest uh, um, uh, field guides. So the what we know uh, from the work of Chris Falliar, uh, uh, Filardi and and others um, is that the family evolved quite recently between four and a half and five and a half million years ago. Um, it rapidly diversified into 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 you know many many species within the last two million years, and it has the fastest known rate of speciation among birds, uh, between two and a quarter and and three species per million years. The only thing that beats the white ice in terms of rates of speciation is the uh, cichlid fish in Lake Malawi. Uh, nothing else evolves that fast. So that's pretty cool. Think about that. We've got these amazing evolutionary, um, ongoing evolutionary uh, uh, things happening in you know, birds on our doorstep, step, birds that come to our, our garden on a daily basis. Then there's another good example, which is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the common blackbird, which is not a blackbird in the sense of the North American blackbird. It's actually a thrush uh, found in Europe. And they started colonizing cities about 200 years ago. And, and the birds in the city versus the birds in the forest have been compared. And the birds that have moved into the cities have shorter beaks. Uh, they've stopped moving around. They don't migrate as, uh, anymore. Uh, they respond differently to stress. Uh, they breed earlier in the year. They have different pitch calls. Uh, they don't interbreed, at least not very much, with forest populations. And, and these are presumably adaptations from colonizing what was a new niche for them 200 years ago when people started moving into cities. <clears throat> Their genetics have been studied recently, and there's no obvious significant difference in the genetics between the forest populations and the urban populations. So it's not clear how these differences are maintained and sustained. It could be that they indicate phenotypic plasticity. So not everything is, is evolution. Sometimes genes are controlled um, by epigenetic genetic effects and the genes may respond differently depending on epigenetic factors that control the expression of those genes. So this is another possibility, but certainly something is going on here evolutionarily between these uh, blackbirds in the city and blackbirds in the forest. We just don't understand it fully yet. So that's the end of my show. I went on, uh, I think, 15 minutes longer than I had intended. This is just a sampler of some of the things that live in the world of evolutionary biology. Um, to really understand birds, you really do need to understand some evolutionary biology. So please spread the words to your fellow birder, the to your fellow birders that uh, you know they're missing out if they don't understand some aspects of evolutionary biology. Because you know you can't understand uh, those birds uh, in the absence of evolutionary biology. You know this little cisticola here, the the uh, nedeke. Imagine if you didn't know anything about evolutionary biology and you went into an area and there were all these different cisticolas and you would wonder what the heck is going on here. So uh, evolutionary biology really helps you be a better birder, I think. And there's a lot more that we need to know about bird evolution. You know, so far we've only scratched the surface. I mean, we've only been working on these Liaoning fossils for the last uh, 20, or 20, 20, 20 or 25 years, less actually for the most part. Because uh, the big uh, mother load of fossils has actually been only been discovered quite quite recently, so there's a lot more that we still need to know about bird evolution, and uh, it's a it's a really interesting area. If I was starting over as a biologist now, I think with my interest in birds, this is what I would get into studying. So that's that's it for for now. Um, I think we will have some questions if you are still prepared to stick around for another few minutes. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Um, perhaps I can fire off some of the questions. There were quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, Henny asked a couple of questions. The first was in relation to those finches. The couple studying them found they adapted, uh, the bill changed over relatively only a few generations. And he wanted to know, did the finches' bills return to normal when rainfall returned back to normal patterns? 
Uh, and what if the long or shorter bill is no longer suitable for normal rainfall patterns? Yes, so it went both ways. Um, when, so that, you know, during their studies, they had a long period of drought and, and the, you know, the, the shape of the bill changed. I can't remember whether the bills got thicker or thinner, um, but you can imagine that, you know, if they're, if they're eating insects and, and seeds that are, that are uh, you know, after many years, they're broken up into small pieces and they're down in the, in the dirt and, you know, they've got to poke into there to get them. You would imagine um, that the, having a smaller bill would, would help. But then there, uh, there might be birds with a thin, thinner bill that are specialized to feed on small seeds, but those small seeds are not available in the dry years. So they get larger bills in order to feed on the larger seeds that are still, you know, where there are some still available. Um, you know, and uh, I can't remember the details of it. Um, there's some really good uh, videos on YouTube um, if you want to watch them, and there's, uh, you know, I've I've read a couple of their papers, and then I mean their work research is out of this world amazing. I mean they are in league with Charles Darwin, I think, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, the it, it goes both ways. Uh, you know, when the rains came back after the long drought, uh, the selection pressures changed, and over over several years, the birds adapted in the other direction, uh, which is quite interesting. Okay, and they've thanks. done the genetics as well. So, you know, they've, they've got all the scientific data. They've done everything, the behavioral studies, um, genetics, uh, measuring the seeds on the ground in relation to the size of the bill. They've done so much incredible work. Uh, Henny also asked, uh, he went on to ask a couple of questions in relation to weavers and particularly, I think in, in, in relation to the thing of sexual selection where female weavers demolish a nest because they don't like it. And there's the whole question as to, is that a form of selection or is the female rather signaling that she's not ready to mate? Um, so is it the female that demolishes the nest? I've never seen the female do it. I've only seen the male, uh, but it could be that, uh, you know, the male is not successfully. So it depends on who's doing it, you know, whether it's the female or yeah. the male. Uh, certainly in my garden, it's always the, always seems to be the male that demolishes the nest. He builds it, yes. doesn't like it, he tears it down. Or he builds it, uh, he gets confused and, and can't build it any further, and then he tears it down. That seems to happen as well. Um, but I imagine if, a, if he built a nest and the nest was complete and it didn't get a mate, he might tear it down and build another one, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I made some... I made a couple of comments there on the on the chat room to everyone because it's an, in, an area I've been quite interested in. And just this weekend, I was out at Falkirk Dam and observed, which is something I've seen quite a few times, and that is a, a trainee colony of young male weavers all building nests together. And in, even with a human eye, you can see the nests are really poor. They're not even really complete. But the females show no interest in these males. So I think the way it works with weavers is the males... Uh, the, the, the skill of building a nest is something the males have to learn. It's obviously genetically coded that they need to build a nest, but the actual skill of building the nest takes practice. So, yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's believe, like riding a bicycle. Huh? You got, you yeah, know, you, so I believe that some there's some research, I, I can't remember who did it on Southern Mast Weaver, in that they have to build 11 nests uh, before one is, on average, before one is accepted by a female. And in, in the weavers, the, ex, the acceptance of the nest by the female is the kind of selection process because once the female selected the nest, she then mates with that male who built the nest. So the, it's not a display, it's a nest building capability that is the selection pressure. Mm. I, I've seen the same thing with the uh, uh, red-headed weavers in Kruger where the one male had like four nests going at the same time and no females anywhere nearby, not, not even remotely interested. Um, and I, I also came to the, to the, you know, got the impression that this was a practice. You know, this was, it's, it's, it's not that they're learning from each other. Uh, they, they practicing what their genes tell them to do until they get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Then we've got a question from uh, Bailey Mark Weiss in relation to breeding colors of some species. So there's some species that lose their breeding colors during the winter non-breeding season, like Euplectes, like the bishops and widows. And then there are a whole bunch of other species that don't lose colors at all. 
So he's asking about the benefit of why and why some some become camouflage and, and crimson breasted trikes don't lose any color at all in the non breeding season. Uh, I think he's asking if it's phylogenetically clustered or is there something else going on here? Well, certainly you, you can see that it is, uh, it, it, it does happen in, in, in related groups. So if you look at the, at the Euplectes, for example, and, and, and uh, you know, they, that's a good, good example. You know, they, they pretty much all lose their uh, colors to breeding colors to some extent. Um, so, so there must be some some commonality in their in their uh, evolution, uh, in their yeah. ancestry. That uh, you know the the common ancestor of all of them probably uh, had that pattern, and uh, you know there must be some selective benefit uh, to doing it. So presumably, you know if, if you're a male and you're not going to be attracting females, and you have you know very ornate uh, uh, feathers that you know something like the long tail weather bird widow bird has or some of the other uh, widow birds that also have long tails. Keeping that through the winter when it's not of any use, is going to, uh, you know, it's going to be an energy burden. So if a few of the males in a population start losing those, um, you know, that, that those expensive uh, coats that they're wearing, uh, they will survive better the winter and therefore leave the genes for losing the, for losing the, 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 their, their, their summer breeding colors, uh, you know, those genes will increase yeah. in the population because of the, it has survival value. Uh, so, you know, I, that's how I can imagine how it would work, how it actually works in, in, in reality. I think I'd, I'd have to go and uh, read some journals. As I said, I'm not an ornithologist. I'm trying to just use uh, birds uh, to teach some basic principles of, of evolutionary biology, because I think it's important for birders to to understand. So yeah, I mean, you know, we, we can, you can give me an assignment and I'll go read up on it. But, uh, you know, other than speculating about it, I, I, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, I mean, you can look at it from another point of view as well. And that is, uh, you know, are the, are the, are the birds, um, 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 you know, do they, do they form pairs for life or at least for an extended period of time. So if you look at uh, the Narina trogon that I was showed at the beginning there, you know, in, um, in, in, in uh, Likalamitsi, the, you know, the, doesn't matter what time of the year you go there, the, the male's colorful, the female's less colorful. Uh, and uh, presumably there's some bleeding of the genes because, you know, the, it depends on which chromosome the genes, is on, the genes are on. Uh, whether the female has that gene or not, or whether it's split in some way between male and female chromosomes, and whether the, the female has some epigenetic genetic effect that suppresses some aspect of the coloring. But you can see from a bird like the Narena trogon that the female has less of the colors, but she still has the colors. And uh, if you think about it, there, uh, if she's making a choice on the basis of she certainly don't make a choice on the basis of how the male sings from the Chogans because they sing terribly. Um, but the, uh, you know, and they have like two note calls. Um, but she may be making a choice on the basis of the color pattern of the males. And so retaining that color pattern through the winter when, you know, it's, it's not necessary for breeding might help retain the bonding of the pairs. So I don't know about the, uh, you know, th things like the crimson breast of strike, whether they, you know, whether they are, um, you know, whether they, you know, they pair for life or something like that, something close to that or what, but th th that would be one selective force that would, you know, would override perhaps the, uh, the selective pressure of losing those colors. And I think it also depends on, you know, how, you know, what other selective pressures that are, that are, uh, um, in in force. So if you're out in a field, you know, where any raptor can catch you, uh, it, there may be advantages to being brown and drab in the in the winter. Uh, you know, and the grass is also brown and drab, and you're, it's harder for a raptor to see you. So there are lots of uh, evolutionary pressures at for at at at, bay, at play here. And I, but I think the you know one of the one of the important ones is going to be the. Uh, the, the, you know, whether they're, they're monogamous or polygynous, 
um, well, that will have a huge impact on the selective pressures that, that are able to impact on the coloration. So that's all speculation, uh, but it's speculation based on at least a little bit of knowledge of biology. Derek, I'm going to come in there and just um, point out, perhaps people are not aware that with the weavers, you've got species that are monogamous and that are polygamous. And so all the ones that are, as far as I know, all the, in Southern Africa, all the weavers that are polygynous uh, lose their plumage. The males lose their breeding plumage. And all the ones that are monogamous don't lose their breeding plumage. So those are in, the, in, a, in a related group. So you've got dark, you've got uh, spectacled weavers and olive-headed weavers. And as far as I'm aware, they don't have any breeding plumages. And those are the two that are monogamous in the weaver group. And that's interesting. And that, that, that supports what I was saying, that the, the pair bonding, uh, you know, it, it, it pays to, to keep the female happy with your color. You know, you should wear your tuxedo <laughs> all year round. Sorry, uh, another question from Harriet. Question from Harriet was, how is inbreeding controlled, especially in species that nest in mixed colonies like weavers? I have no idea, but I will go and, and read about it. I think it's got to do with the mate, the mate recognition system of the specific species, that every species has got its own specific behavior, which it recognizes as sexy. Um, and the behavior yeah, between, the say, two different species of weaver would be a little bit different. So that uh, a lesser mast weaver breeding in a colony of southern mast would recognize the calls are different and the behaviors are different. So that's not, not somebody I'm interested in. But I think what, like uh, if I understood the question correctly, what uh, Harriet is asking is, uh, how is inbreeding control? Oh, in sorry, other words, no, I missed it completely. In other words, how do you avoid mating with your brother? Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I, I have no idea. It's, a, it's something I never, never even thought about, but uh, there must be some mechanism there because, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I'll find out, Harriet, uh, or if it's yeah. not known, I will tell you I was unable to find out, but I can't uh, even Harriet speculate about another, that one. Harriet asks another question. Evolution is going on, is extinction of species going on as well? And if yes, do we have recent examples of those species that have disappeared naturally? Not to my knowledge, uh, do we have uh, examples of species that have disappeared naturally, depending on how you define naturally, uh, because you know uh, our species is a biological uh, species as well. And uh, but you know we've most of the species that have gone extinct in our historical and relative, you know, the, well, even let's just say, since we evolved as homo sapiens, uh, probably the, the, we were the, we were the, the cause of the ultimate extinction. There may be other, other factors at play, such as, you know, the habitat and, and uh, uh, the food changing, um, you know, uh, but in general, I don't know of any species that we know of that's gone um, extinct naturally, but you have to bear in mind if you look at that, you know, the gra the, the diagram that I showed of the awful, um, you know, immensity and shortness of time, uh, you know, time, the time over which birds have evolved has been enormous, 100 and, uh, 100 and, and, and 40 or so million years compared with us, you know, 100,000 years or so. Um, that's not a very long time for us to have observed. Uh, but certainly in the fossil record, we know of lots of birds that have gone extinct. Uh, yeah. Naturally, because uh, we weren't around to cause it. <laughs> yes. Okay, I think last question from Joel at this stage. Um, does the fact that female birds are heterozygous and males are homozygous impact how birds evolve? I don't even know what that means. So they would be heterozygous with respect to certain genes, uh, but you can't, a bird can't be heterozygous. Um, you know, you, you can have a gene for, you can be heterozygous uh, with respect to the gene for high co eye color, for example, um, but you can't be heterozygous as a person or as an individual uh, or as a species or as a sex. 
Well, perhaps Joel, if you're there, but you might want to just unmute and explain the question because I, I have to be honest, I also don't understand it. Um, if Joel wants to uh, unmute. Okay, yeah. With um, like male, like human females have XX chromosomes and males have XY chromosomes, but in birds, um, male females are what are called ZW, and males are ZZ. Um, so it's, they, they are, the difference is um, in the sex chromosomes. So females are heterozygous. Okay. No, that's not called heterozygous, though. It's called. It's got another name. I've forgotten what the name is. But heterozygous. Okay, I've forgotten the name. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Um. Uh, I think uh, heterogametic. I think is. Yes. That, that that I think that's it. Yeah, or something like that. Anyway. Uh, so I mean, I don't know. Uh, that's that's the the honest answer. I have no idea. I haven't even thought about it. Um, but it will be interesting to. Uh, to read up on it. Um, I mean, I would imagine it, it, it would because, uh, yeah, uh, but exactly how or why and, and what role the, 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 the sex chromosomes would play in that evolution, uh, it would be hard to, uh, hard to know. Because I mean, I think if you think about it, you know, we, we as, as humans have, uh, um, you know, some of our characteristics are on the Y chromosome. And, uh, and so they can only be expressed if you have the Y chromosome. And um, so I would imagine, you know, that, uh, you know, with a bird, it would be, it would be something similar, but perhaps in reverse. Uh, but yeah. how it works, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> this is, there is a bee flying around here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to go read up on that. It's a, like I said, I'm not an ornithologist. I'm, a, I'm just a guy who, who knows a little bit about, uh, about evolutionary biology. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Joel, just to say, to, I think Joel also commented there that with the weavers, there's a lot of juvenile and immature dispersal after, you know, immediately after breeding, which would reduce the possibility of inbreeding the question that um, Harriet asked. So I think in some cases you've got behaviors which are specifically designed to reduce inbreeding because in the long, you sort of the macro level of evolution, you don't want a lot of inbreeding because it limits the amount of evolution you can have. Yeah, and that's actually a good point because uh, you know inbreeding is a major selective, sorry, dispersal is a major uh, selective advantage uh, you know, so if you have the genetic uh, predisposition to disperse, um, then, you, you know, you, that, that gene should increase in frequency in the population as a consequence of, uh, of not having that um, inbreeding happen and therefore lowering the fitness in the next generation. So that's, yeah. actually, a very, that's actually a very good suggestion. Okay, I think with the, we don't have any further questions. If anyone has a question, they might want to just unmute um, and, and ask it verbally. We're, we're not a huge crowd at this stage. Well, spread the word. We can always do this one again. Uh... Certainly, I think it is something we should try and do again and try and get more people uh, you know, interested. I think you're right in a way. It's a bit curious that um, more, more people ha don't really talk about evolution. And I think for me, as a field birder, you think about it all the time because there's so many things going on that, that are explained or let's say elucidated once you understand a little bit about evolution. You just, things make more, much more sense. Absolutely. And, uh, and even when you don't know what the answer is, you know what the question is. And once you know what the question is, you can go off and find the answer. Absolutely. But I think, uh, Derek, you've got lots of good feedback from, um, from a number of people who've all said, very useful talk, very, very interesting. And it would be great to do it again at some stage. But uh, I think, uh, are you going to cover what's coming up? Or do you want me to briefly mention that oh gosh i forgot yeah I, I if you can i i'd appreciate it i'm kind of uh, worn out now 
Okay, no problem at all. I think um, if I can just say thank you very much for to Derek. I know we worked hard at putting this presentation together because it's really quite a lot to cram into a shortish presentation and, and I think it makes a huge amount of sense. So thank you very much and we have to see all of you again. Uh, before I close, I'm just going to mention what's coming up in the very, in the very near future. Um, so we've got... Um, um, where is it now? We've got next week, um, the 28th is the next uh, webinar. That's a masterclass by Derek. So Derek's doing a lot of uh, work here. Introduction to managing and, your, and processing your bird, your bird photos with a free Digicam and dark table. Now, this, I think this is really useful to birders because they spend a lot of money on software and there's really good uh, products out there. So that's on the 28th at 7 p.m. It is a masterclass. So you need to pay to attend that one. And then the day after 29th of, of October, we have Birding in Colombia with Jürgen Beckers, who's written some fantastic books on the birds of Colombia. And then the following week, we do, two ses we do a session on uh, completely looking at another corner of the world, the birds of Newfoundland and Labrador, perched on the edge with Jared Clark. And that's been run twice. The first one on the 5th of November is for, for uh, uh, North American time. So it's 10.30 p.m. at night here. So we're doing it again. Jared has kindly agreed to do it again on the 12th of November, and that'll be uh, at uh, a more suitable time, 7 p.m. South African time. And we're going to have a few other things uh, definitely on offer by the next few days. Um, so just keep an eye on our website and you'll see uh, what we have coming up. So once again, thanks all uh, very much for coming out and enjoy the evening and thanks a lot and goodbye.